This is Bible Academy. Today we continue in our special series, The Life of David, in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 18. Now before we begin every lesson, I remind you to make sure that you have confessed your known sins, according to 1 John 1, 9, so we can be in fellowship with the Lord. At the same time, you're allowing yourself to be controlled by His Spirit, by giving ourselves over to Him. Let's pray. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this opportunity and the privilege and the time and all that we have to study your word. We ask that our hearts and minds be open and ready to receive it. In Jesus' name, amen. There's a couple of things I want to mention before we get into our lesson today. Um, I'm trying a different format. You will see that as soon as we get started. I'm not sure how this is going to work. The biggest challenge for me is remembering where to push the buttons and where not regarding the uh, mouse or you'll get the wrong screen up there so this is a challenge it's uh, going to be uh, slow and tedious I'm afraid more than usual plus the lesson is not simple it has a lot of detail and movement around on the screen I've done so many experiments on this type of thing, trying to find the best way to do it. I usually try, I usually try to keep it simple, uh, which is not easy because I'm doing so many things at the same time with the mouse and the keyboard and the, and the writing pen and looking at a couple of screens sometimes as well as two or three things on the same screen and moving them around. So I try to do my best on this, but be patient with me. This is going to be kind of an experiment but I think it'll be okay. Now, the next thing I want to talk about is today is December 5th. Tomorrow is what we call D-Day in the United States as well as probably other parts of the world where the United States and their allies hit the beaches of Normandy and started their uh, conquest, you might say, to take back Europe from Nazi Germany. If you go back and look at the history of Nazi Germany and see how they built and how Hitler was actually elected, how he fixed himself into being the Fuhrer, you'll see that there are similar things going on in the world today. Now, I'm not a prophet, not the son of a prophet, as my old professor used to say, but we are headed in a similar direction. We see it in our country, here in the United States. I can see it in other countries myself and the way the world is going. A number of things are going on right now that seem to be pointing to the desire for a dictator. Now, this is some assumptions I'm making, but let me just pull some things out from memory. We see how the economy is going. We see the big push for green energy that controls much of our political decisions so that they don't really care how high gas prices get because they think this is the price we have to pay to go over to electricity. And I go on and on on those things. I mean, where are you going to get electricity from? It doesn't come from nowhere. You have to burn fuel. You have to burn coal or water and then wind. And all these things are very difficult. If it wasn't, then why haven't they done them already? So we see all these things going in one direction. We see the corruption of the government, I'm speaking of the United States, just about from top to bottom thoroughly, including the law enforcement agencies, I mean the federal ones, Department of Justice, the FBI, all these organizations that are supposed to stand for integrity and be trustworthy have been so corrupted, all the way down to our local police departments in many cases. Now, if you're aware of these things, uh, that's a good thing. But understand, the only way we're going to be ready for what's coming is to make sure we're doing God's will we're in God's place. We're serving Him. 
that we are faithful to him. We have seen in the life of David his tremendous faithfulness, his trusting God. He's made some mistakes. He's going to make more. But his overall attitude, his faithfulness to the Lord has been firm. He comes back when he falls away. That's what we're expected to do. That's why we confess our sins. Many of us will sin every day, many times every day. That's why God has graciously given us a way in which we can get back right with him and fellowship with the Lord through confession of our sins. So we may do that several times a day. It's a grace system by which we can maintain our fellowship with the Lord. And if we're going to grow spiritually, we have to keep confessing our sins, walking in his spirit. That's the power we need to live the Christian life. Now, I tell you all this because, in my view, it seems that we're coming to the end of the end. Or you might even say the beginning of the final, final days. And with that in mind, it is imperative that we don't waste time that we live pure lives, that we live obedient lives, and grow spiritually so we can make the right decisions. No doubt, things are going to get worse. If you remember last year, if you went over my God's plan of the ages, and as soon as this new administration here in the United States got in, and he signed all these executive orders, that canceled out things that were good for our economy, for our defense, for the general overall welfare of the people of the United States. As soon as the president started signing all these orders that canceled those things out that made it possible, I told you this is going to happen, this is going to happen. One of them I said, as soon as you start going after the fuel industry, the fossil fuel industry, the oil companies, you get high expenses in your fuels, which spreads across the board. So now gas is, pri is twice as high as it was last year or when the president, I shouldn't say last year, but when the president took office. And then the prices of groceries just continue to go up. The utilities, and I don't have to tell you this if you live in the United States, but there's no signs of things getting better. If anything, it'll get worse. There may be food shortages. We may have a, well, depression. They talk about recession. It's hard to always tell what difference is. Both painful, however you look at it. But there's going to be security problems, perhaps in our neighborhoods. I don't know. But I don't see anything getting any better. So there's no time to waste. It's urgent that we grow spiritually. Now, David's a grand example in fact, we basically study his whole lifetime from the time he was a shepherd boy to his death. And we're going to see a man who did most everything right. And we also learn that David is someone God could work with. So if I was to do a sermon, and I'm not big on doing sermons, there's lots of reasons I don't. I would probably title this something like, Are You Someone God Can Work With? You have to be responsive to his word. You have to know his word and do his will. And most of all, what we see with David, he presented himself to the Lord as his servant. So, with those things in mind, let's get started. In our last lesson, we looked at and finished the Davidic Covenant. Let's look at some major points of that major covenant. There's four major covenants in the uh, Bible. There's the Abrahamic, the uh, Mosaic, the Davidic, and then the New Covenant, which we live under today. I've discussed those thoroughly again in that series, God's Plan of the Ages. Well, here's our new format you can see on the board here. I'm going to try to keep the verse at the top. However, I'm dealing with two different screens here. I mean, two different uh, 
softwares here. So if I click on one, the other one will go off. And I have to remember not to do that. <laughs> so that's the thing I'm going to have to watch out carefully. So I may be very deliberate and slow here during this lesson. But we've got a lot of ground to cover. Now let's put on the board the points, the major points we saw in the Davidic Covenant. One, David will have a great name. That was in 7.9. Two, the Lord's blessing or curse to those who bless or curse his people. 7.9 through 10. And you can see some of these are an extension of the Abrahamic Covenant as well as the Mosaic Covenant, because you see these promises carry over to David. Three, there is a land for the people and peace. We saw the land with Abraham, for sure. Four, the dynasty begins with David and continues only through David's line. Now, this is something new. This is Davidic. Though there was kings to be uh, coming from the offspring of uh, Moses and Sarah. This is where it really starts for the people of Israel. Yes, Saul was king, and he was a Jew, and he'd have been the first king from Abraham for the people of Israel, uh, from Abraham for the people of Israel. But now the dynasty comes through David. So it begins with David and continues only through David's line, David's offspring. It has to be a son, a grandson, a great-grandson, and then it goes on and on and on. Five, the house or dynasty is established for the Lord's name. This is for the Lord. So it's not just for David. It's for the Lord. It's part of the Lord's plan. It's part of his plan to bring in his son to be the eternal reigning king. And that brings us to point six. The dynasty will include a son who will rule over the kingdom forever. Seven, the son of David, Solomon, will build the Lord's temple. Now this is, remember the question was raised, or David wanted to build the temple, but this is the Lord's response, this Davidic covenant. But it included the fact that his son Solomon would build a temple. We also see in point eight, there's a special father-son relationship between God and the King of Israel. And this is something you need to understand, especially when you study the Psalms. A special relationship. Nine, the obedient son is blessed or disciplined according to his obedience. Now that, of course, is a father-son relationship. You do good, you obey, you get blessed. You disobey, you get disciplined. See that in the life of David. Ten, God's loving kindness, his kessed, will never depart. It never departs. This whole line, God's always there to act in loving kindness. Now, let me just add this. The problem with this line of kings that comes from David is that they're not obedient. God's standing there with the loving kindness. But they're so disobedient that about all they can get is discipline. And that's much of the history of Israel. Once the kingdom split, and to the northern tribes and the southern tribes. The northern tribes, almost every king, in fact, I think every king is called evil or he's not good. The southern kings has a much better percentage of better or what we call good kings. But what happens is only the line of David comes down to the southern tribe of Judah. And that's maintained up till the Babylonian captivity. Keep that in mind. And then it's set aside and picked up again when Christ walks upon the earth. The king is back in the line of David. But then we know he just came back not to conquer the enemy, but rather to die for the sins of the world. Now, we come down to point 11, and I put down here, in addition. This isn't in the covenant, but this is some important points that kind of fill in to help explain. Once the temple is built by Solomon, the Lord will fill it with his glory and be present among his people. 
And there's your references. 1 Kings 6, 12 through 13, 2 Chronicles 7, 1 through 4, and then 12. The Lord Jesus Christ will be the ultimate fulfillment of the promises of the promise as the son of David and rule over the nations of the world. Many scriptures on that. Psalm 2, 8 through 12, 72, 8 through 11, um, 89, 29, Micah 5, 2. Okay. Well, David has received this grand covenant. Uh, we might even say that's more than you can imagine anyone had ever received. And then in verses 18 through 29, we have David's prayerful, prayerful response to the Lord. David has great gratitude. He talks about the present which I just call the present gratitude. All right? In verse 18, David begins to show his gratitude and in doing so expresses his own humility. Then King David went in and sat before the Lord and said, Who am I, O Lord God, and what is my house that you have brought me this far. So what happens is, remember, the Ark of God or Ark of the Lord, Ark of the Covenant, same thing, or in this tent in Jerusalem. David apparently goes inside the tent and sets down before the Ark. Now people usually didn't sit before the Ark. They would, they would uh, do what they needed to do, especially the high priest on the Day of Atonement. But anyone who sits before the Ark, who would do that? Well, the only thing that makes any sense is because David was king, it seems that he had that prerogative. And we know that as the Psalms tell us, like Psalm 110, the Lord said to my Lord, sit down on my right hand. And that is the Lord Jesus Christ that eventually fulfills that uh, uh, promise, or we might say that command. At any rate... David sets before the Lord. Now, even though the glory of the Lord has not come to the tent yet, the presence of the Lord was there. Now, that's something we have to assume because it tells us here. Now let's sort something out that gets complicated. I even though if I even though I'm going to try to sort this out, you're probably not going to remember because it's it's too difficult uh, to remember. At least it is for me, and uh, I'll I'll explain why. You can up to a point, let's, let's say that, but then you're going to probably forget. So anyway, <laughs> let's talk about the terms up here, Lord God. Oh, Lord God. Now, the Hebrew, I'm going to just use a transliteration, is, is Adon, uh, Adon, we'll keep it simple, Yahweh. All right. Adon basically means Master Lord. Yahweh, we've studied many times, is the personal name for God. I am is what it basically says. I am. It's how the Lord introduced himself to Moses at the burning bush. Now here's the tricky thing. Depending on your uh, English translation, if you were to just have these words separated in the text, you would have Lord, or perhaps Lord. Over here, usually you'll see all four capital letters. However, when you see these two words together in the Hebrew text, your translators will not translate this Lord, Lord. And you can see why they might not want to do that. So, what do they do? Well, I don't like it, but they do it anyway. The NIV will translate Adon as sovereign. 
Yes, sovereign. And they'll keep this one Lord. I like the fact they do that because that stays consistent with Yahweh. The King James, the New American Standard, will go Lord. Then they go God. All three capital letters. Well, that does justice to this one, but then that's really not the word, because the word for God is usually Elohim. The ESV, they'll go Lord over here, and then they'll put this, small g-o-d, or, you know, uppercase g, then o-d. So, like I said, it's confusing. Now, how do you sort this out? Well, first of all, look at your, look at your translation. Go to the front of it, and I think you'll find in most of the front of it, it'll explain which method they use. Uh, or you can try to remember what I just did here. But uh, I use several translations, and I see this. I said, well, that's confusing. So I try to say, stay consistent. And as you see, I use the Lord God one, which you see um, right here. That's the way the NASB and the King James Version do it. It's not because I particularly like those versions, though I do like the NASB uh, better than most. But I'm going to try to stay with this. And then what makes it even more confusing, in the same verse, you may see the name Yahweh. And they'll go back to the capital L-O-R-G. Or you'll see Elohim. And they'll use the G-O-D. So when these two words are together, you're going to see this, and I'll just call it an odd combination to try to communicate it. And sometimes I'll just say Adon Yahweh. And even Adon is, it could be Adonai or Adonai or Anoki, which is the first person singular. And that's what we have in this verse, by the way, Anoki. Uh, it's a pronoun, but I'm just going to try to keep it simple, let you know what we're talking about, and just say, I don't. All right, now that may be more than you expected, but sometimes we have to do some explaining, as they say. Okay, let's continue in our verse. So then King David went in and sat before the Lord, that's Yahweh, by the way, and said, Who am I, O Lord God? Adon Yahweh. And what is my house that you have brought me this far? Now this is a way of saying, as we would say even in the English, who am I for you to do something like that? I don't deserve this. And that's what basically David's doing. What is my house? What is my heritage? What is my background? Uh, we have no money. We have no property. Uh, nothing to deserve anything like this. Well, that's one of the points. It is undeserving. As good as David was, he was still undeserving. He said, but David is great. Yes, he wasn't perfect. He wasn't the Lord Jesus. So why did God bless him? Loving kindness. Loving kindness. In the New Testament, we call it grace. Any humble person knows that their life has far too many failures and shortcomings to receive anything of blessing from the Lord. This recognition of one's own lack of worthiness is the starting point of greatness before God. Without humility, one does not recognize the need for help or forgiveness or mercy and total dependence upon the Lord. Uh, this is something I have, well, jumped on my soapbox many times. We have to depend upon the Lord to live the Christian life. You say, well, I try my best. Well, let me just say this very clearly. You can't live the Christian life on your own. That's why you have the Holy Spirit. You have to live under his control to be consistently obedient. And, and sense his promptings when you know you're about to sin. And that's pretty obvious in most cases. 
or we need to get back in fellowship with him and confess your sin. Humility was a major characteristic of David, and this is what made him great before the Lord. He was someone the Lord could work with. Now, the Bible is clear that David lived a faithful life. But you say, yeah, but he he did his thing with Bathsheba and Uriah, and he made these other errors in judgment. Yes, he did. But David's fundamental attitude of life is, I'm going to be a servant of the Lord. Let me tell you something. Being a servant of the Lord also assumes that you're going to fail, that you're going to have shortcomings, you're going to do something you shouldn't have done, you're going to say something you shouldn't have said, or not say something you should have said. But God still chose him from among, from among the sheep. David says he has no lineage, no wealth, no grand accomplishments. In fact, God chose him before his grand accomplishments became known, like, or even happened, I should say, like killing Goliath. He was chosen, remember, in the field while with the sheep. What he had done at that point? What he had done? Stay with the sheep, trust the Lord, wait on the Lord. David had no idea that he had to face Goliath and then become king. The Lord saw his heart. The Lord knew that David was someone he could work with. Well, David goes on to question why the Lord would do this. The point is, David, his house, will be made great by the Lord. David believed that as part of the Davidic covenant. As we continue to go through this, remember David has been serving the Lord for some time now. He settled in Jerusalem. He settled there, brought the ark. He's ready to get things back right for the nation. Notice, great rulers do things for the people that's best for them. He goes on in verse 19. If I remember to do this, yes, I did. And yet this was a small thing in your eyes, O Lord God. You have spoken also of your servant's house for a great while to come. And this is the instruction for mankind, O Lord God. Now this verse, like many of these, needs some sorting out. He begins by saying, and yet this was a small thing in your eyes, O Lord God. Now, this is a way of saying, yet this was not enough for David. Yet this was not enough for David. In other words, there was more coming. It's an awkward way to put it in English, but and you'll see some of your translations will basically interpret it uh, and, and say it differently, but that's the idea. In other words, there's more coming. His house, his offspring will receive great blessing as well. Now look what it says next. You have spoken also of your servant's house. What's going to come to the family? For a great while to come, for a long time, things are going to keep coming to David's family. His descendants. So in the Lord's eyes, God has more to give him. This acknowledges that the Lord has more coming to David in the future, even after his death. And this is laid out in the Davidic covenant. Not all, of course, just to say that it's going to start what your descendants are going to have. And then it is, at the end of this verse, said to be, this is instruction for mankind as David says, O oh Lord God, again. Notice how many times he says, O oh Lord God. Adon Yahweh. Master Lord Yahweh. Yahweh is David's master, his Lord. So what we see here in the Lord's eyes, God has more to give David. 
This acknowledges that the Lord has more coming to David in the future. And this is instruction for all mankind. In other words, all need to hear about what the Lord has given David. I have said this before in this series, um, as I recall, and that is that one of the first things I taught, one of the first series I did years ago when I started this video series, is it was the Christmas special, and it included the Davidic covenant. Through that came our Lord Jesus. Speaking in third person, verse 20, David continues, Again, what more can David say to you? For you know your servant, O Lord God. What else can David say about all of this? Whatever David says, the Lord already knows. He calls himself your servant. David acknowledges his place before the Lord, a servant of the Lord. is how every believer should see himself before the Lord. David acknowledges the Lord's full knowledge of him. And he says, for you know your servant. David is well aware that the Lord knows his mind and his heart. He knows him completely. Yet he still gets this great honor and blessing. Even passed on to his descendants. The gratitude and humility of overflows from David here. He knows he neither earned this or deserved any of this. He's simply serving. In Old Testament terms, this undeserved goodness and blessing from God is called kesed. Often translated loving kindness in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, the concept is grace. Well, David continues to speak to the Lord, Adon Yahweh, verse 21. Because of your word and according to your own heart, he's talking to the Lord now, you have brought about all this greatness to make your servant know it. Another little awkward sentence here. We'll sort it out. It is because the Lord's word, as a promise to David, as we saw it in the covenant. It says, according to your own, now listen to this, the Lord's heart. What does that mean? That means his will, his purpose, his plan, his design plan that he has. And in that plan, David. So that's what that's referring to because of your word, your promise, according to your own heart, your your, your purpose, your will, you have brought all this greatness. Some of your translations say great things. Basically says the same thing. But that's what it is. All these great things to David. Because it's according to his word. It's what God said to, is going to happen. Okay? It's also according to his plan. It fits his plan. He's brought about all this greatness. And then it says at the end, to make your servant know it. And that's what David just learned from the Davidic covenant. Now, this is overwhelming to David, who calls it all this greatness or great things. An eternity passed in the decrees of the Godhead. A member of the Godhead, the Son, would be sent to take on human flesh and die for the sins of the human race. David would be chosen, be the chosen grandfather who had received the promise that the Savior was coming through his line, the Messiah. The Messiah would come through David's offspring. All of this was part of the promise and plan of God. The promise is right here in the Davidic covenant. And this included telling him about it, which is our last phrase here, to make your servant know it. Let's put this another way. It was in the plans and purposes, the heart of God, to put this promise in the form of a covenant to David with all these great things and let him know about it. And as we saw, it came to David through the prophet Nathan. 
Keep in mind, David responding to all the great things God has promised him in the covenant. The next part of the prayer goes to the past. Praise for what God has already done, 722 through 24. Brings us to verse 22. Therefore you are great, O Lord God, for there is none like you, and there is no God besides you, according to all that we have heard with our ears. As you can see, almost, not all, but several of these verses are awkward. Uh, they need interpretation uh, to fully understand. The foregone conclusion here that one must come to is, therefore you are great. Adon Yahweh, O Lord God. Five times in five verses, David has addressed God as Adon Yahweh, his owner, his master. The one who he serves is Yahweh. The covenant God, that's his covenant name, the one loyal to this covenant who shows loyal love to his own. He goes on to say, for there is none like you. He is unique. His uniqueness is what this shows. Adon Yahweh is just not special. He's the only one. He's unique. Notice the next line. And there is no God. Now the word for God here is Elohim. And this is the same word that the pagans use for God. It's a plural word, Elohim. When we're talking about the pagan Gods, we just translate it gods with a small g in plural, gods. There is no God besides you. That's what this is saying. There is none like you. According to all that we have heard with our ears. Now, what does this mean? They've heard about the other gods of the other nations. They learn what they are. They know many of them are just false gods or demonically empowered type of uh, forces that are behind these claims that they say about their gods. But the promises, the covenants, the great things God has done are well known to the people of Israel, incomparable things done by Adon Yahweh. It's part of their history, their tradition. David says, our ears, we have all heard it, cannot be ignored, nor should it be. Point of application. We don't always talk about it, but maybe we should do more of that. But Adon Yahweh has and continues to do great things for us, and there is much more to come, things that we can't imagine. Think about it. If Adon Yahweh is great, and he is, and there are none like him, that he's unique. There's no other God besides him. He is the only God. Now listen, and he chose you as one of his own. What does that make you? Well, I don't know about you, but it makes me feel pretty dadgum special. That's why the New Testament calls us elect or chosen Christians. Christians are God's own possession. And we address God accurately as our Father in heaven. Now, this thought of being a special people opens up even more in verse 23. See, I'm continuing to remember this. This is a little awkward. Okay, here, let's just do this. Okay. And who is like your people Israel, the one nation on earth whom God went to redeem to be his people, making himself a name and doing for them great and awesome things for your land before your people, whom you redeemed for yourself from Egypt, a nation and its God. Now this verse... <laughs> with its several lines, all has, also has a lot to say. 
Let's do a couple lines at a time. And who was like your people? The one nation on earth whom God went to redeem to be his people. Now, what does that mean? Well, the fundamental basis of the Mosaic Covenant is said to be their redemption. Their redemption from Egypt. There had to be a freedom given. And the Lord did that himself by providing the leadership and making it possible for them to get out of Egypt. That's called redemption. Now, for the Christian today, the basis of the new covenant is the work of Christ on the cross. We are a redeemed people. So you can see the basic difference between the two covenants. One's based upon the blood of Christ, the work of Christ. The other is based upon God's redemption of the people of Israel from Egypt. Now, the physical deliverance, the physical deliverance of Israel from Egypt, as we know, came at the Exodus. In basic terms, this Exodus event is a redemption. The word redemption basically means buying a slave out of slavery. Someone purchases him, buys him. In this case, the entire people which formed a nation, it models Christ being the redemptive price of purchasing the human race out of the slave market of sin. This Exodus redemption is fixed in history as what the Lord did for the people of Israel. From creating their race with Abraham to their slavery, their redemption from Egypt, with their inept gods, as it mentions here at the end, and their gods, inept gods. And then while in the desert, being given the law, the law that made them unique among the nations of the world. So what this verse does, it sums up a lot of the things that God did to them surrounding their redemption from Egypt. Notice it also says, beginning in our second line up here, making, the end of the line, making himself a name and doing for them great and awesome things for your land before your people. Now, this is the idea that God drove out the occupants of Canaan as Joshua went through with his armies and conquered it. After their deliverance, redemption from Egypt, God went before them and drove many peoples from the promised land. God made himself a name, made himself a name for himself as people heard of the great and awesome things he had done for the people of Israel and the land. Now you got to remember the atmosphere of this day or the environment you might say, the thinking of the people. The nations all had their own gods, often their main gods and his consort and their, and all the sons and children of the gods and the various nature, uh, various uh, gods that attached to nature. But Israel's God was the one that delivered them miraculously from the Egyptian and that made a god from the Egyptians that made a name for him. He became well known. Oh, that's that nation who worships that Yahweh and they claim he delivered them from Egypt with miracles. And that word got around. So what happens is God shows himself so connected to Israel that they also become unique. His name is associated with Israel. They too, the people of Israel, are unique, set apart to the one and only Lord God. They were made holy and were to point to the one and only unique God. They were the one nation on earth, the only nation which God used to make for himself a name. Verse 24. And you establish for yourself your people Israel to be your people forever. And you, O Lord, became their God. 
Israel was redeemed and made God's people. Under the Old Covenant, they were to be the light to the world, live as his people. The Lord, Yahweh, was their God. The one and only unique God had his unique people. So in this prayer, David brings these facts into the present time. With this Davidic covenant, God's people now have a king who will represent God as a king should be to his people. God further gives more to him and his descendants by promising him an offspring king who will rule over his kingdom forever. And for the present, Israel is that kingdom on earth. Israel is God's kingdom on earth, ruled by his chosen king. This makes, let's just use the board for a second, among all the nations of the world, okay, let's just draw a big circle. I'm going to wing it here. Among all the nations of the world, uh, hundreds of city-states, some collected to be larger nations like Assyria or Babylon. You have Israel shining as a light, pointing to the one true God, his name Yahweh. In verse 25, David come to the future part of his prayer. So we have beginning in verse 25. David considers the future. Prayer for divine fulfillment of covenant promises. Verse 25, Now therefore, O Lord God, the word that you have spoken concerning your servant and his house, confirm it forever and do as you have spoken. Now, this is a something we would normally do in our own, well, I'm going to say Western thinking. If God has said it, that's it. David is confirming it back to God. It's like he's repeating it back. God, you said you're going to do that? Okay, here's what you said you're going to do. Verse 25. Now therefore, O Lord God, the word that you have spoken concerning your servant and his house, confirm it. Okay, I was repeating this. Forever. And do as you have spoken. Now, Lord God, notice this time the different spelling. This is Yahweh Elohim. It goes on. The word that you have spoken concerning your servant and his house, David's descendants, confirm it. This is a uh, imperative, it's a command, it's a hifield, causative. It means that God's going to cause it to happen. This is a command to make it happen. When he says, confirm it forever. The promises and covenant is forever. A son ruling the kingdom forever. Now, to use some military vernacular here, it's like, would you repeat that back? That's what David's doing. Confirm it, Lord. So he's asking the Lord to confirm it. In other words, do it. This will result in, verse 26, and your name will be magnified forever, saying, the Lord God of the armies, The Lord of the armies is God over Israel, and the house of your servant David will be established before you. The fulfillment of the promise will magnify the Lord's name. It will be made larger for all to see God's greatness. That's the idea behind magnified. The word magnified, let's get that over there for you. Gadal means become great, and intensity of greatness is the idea behind it. So it intensifies. 
it becomes magnified. That's the way we use it today. It becomes larger. People will know that it is the Lord of the armies is God over Israel. To use the word armies, some of your translations say almighty. That's the idea behind it. He's the one in charge of all the armies. Particularly here, it's the armies of angels. Shows his strength, his mighty. It's like his might. It's like he's the commander in chief. That's how much might he has behind him. He has all this backing him. Remember how the peoples and nations of the world looked to their gods for favor and blessing and reward? And everything from provision to protection to victory in battle, fertility, good crops, healing, and so on. The Lord not only can do all that, but more. As people witness what God does for Israel, and now with servant David, they will know who this God is. He goes on to say, and the house of your servant David, notice your servant, and the house of your servant David, again, David calls himself the servant of the Lord. Seven times in these last five verses, by the way. God himself will see that David's family will be established as a dynasty. Now let's understand what is happening. We have heard and known about the Davidic covenant for a long time. Depending on how long you've studied these video series. Now at the time it was given to David, uh, David's marvelous response is... is uh, is drilled deep into history, what God is doing for him and the people of Israel. What I mean by that, David is putting this down for everyone to understand. We look back at this. David is looking forward at this point in history. Remember that he's looking forward to what's coming. We look back at it and see what God has done for David. David sees great things coming to him. We see great things came to him and his family, and the people of Israel. And there's still more coming for the people of Israel. And much of that we share. Verse 27. For you, O Lord of the armies, the God of, the, the God of Israel, have uncovered the ear, that means revealed, saying, I will build for you a house. Therefore your servant has found his heart to pray this prayer to you. He starts out saying for you, O Lord of the armies, the God of Israel, don't miss this grand title for God uh, expressing his power. O Lord of the armies, the God of Israel. Then we have this expression, the ancient Hebrew expression, uh, have uncovered the ear. In other words, that saying has revealed saying, I will build for you a house. This is at the heart of why this prayer, this dynasty, what the Lord has revealed about building this dynastic house. goes on to say, I will build for, for you a house, therefore your servant has found his heart. Now this is a way of saying his courage, his will, his desire to pray this prayer for you. Verse 28. And now, O Lord God, you are the God, and your words are true, and you have promised this good thing to your servant. Notice he says again, you are the God. Now, let me just pause and get into a little bit of detail again here. There's a pronoun after the word you in the Hebrew. So you have, as I have written out, or have used in my translation as well, you are the God. Not just any God, but the God. Not a God, that would be cap, uh, small g, but you are the God. That's in the Hebrew. Some translate it or interpret it something else. Literally it says, 
you are he, the God. And that's a lock with English. Sometimes the translators will change it around to make it a little smoother English, depending on probably who's doing the English uh, finalization editing on this. But any way you do it, it's pointing to the uniqueness of God. You can look at the translations. It might surprise you that the NIV, the ESV, and the E. N-A-S, okay, N-I-V, E-S-V, N-A-S. Leave it out. Leave the article out. Um, that did surprise me. Uh, Net translates it as you are the true God. Now, the word true is not in there, but they're trying to make the point that it's being emphasized. You are he, the God. All right? But the he is not necessary to put in there makes it a little confusing, so I just leave it out. It says, you are the God, but it's pointing to the uniqueness. David completely understands, recognizes, and confirms to the Lord God that this covenant is clearly understood. He's making that clear. He goes on to say, and your words are true, uh, that's the word emeth. I'll show you a few Hebrew words here. I haven't done much here today. But there's so much to work through in detail. The word means reliable, stable, faithful. When they're spoken, it means trustworthy. So it's like saying, and your words are trustworthy. Furthermore, it says, you have promised this good thing to your servant. So David's saying, it's all loud and clear, Lord. Now go ahead. Do what you need to do now. Do what you're going to do. Do what you promised. So David concludes his prayer in verse 29. Well, I think I've done pretty well on this. Um, I'm surprised. I surprise even myself sometimes. Now, therefore, may it please you to bless the house of your servant so that it may continue forever before you. You know, I just sit back and look at this and say, wow. Now, therefore, may it please you to bless the house of your servant so that it may continue forever before you. For you, O Lord God, have spoken, and with your blessing shall the house of your servant be blessed forever. So David concludes his prayer with a command. May it please you to bless the house of your servant. Like I said, this is like giving the Lord the go-ahead. I got it. I acknowledge it. I understand it. I accept it. I know what you're going to do. I accept it as a fact. Lord, go ahead. So David acknowledges this is a blessing coming to his house. The promise he has been given in the Davidic covenant. He's ready for the blessing to start and then so that it may continue forever before you. Twice David used the term forever here in this verse. Let me just talk about that. It's kind of a technical term, but the word is olam. It means long duration, antiquity, futurity. So in other words, you can look back into the forever or you can look forward to the forever. So we'd say forever past, forever future, okay? Sometimes in the future it will be translated everlasting or just forever as we have it. It's repeated in this prayer. Note that even though David has been given this promise, he basically says it's back to the Lord. Like acknowledging it. He says it back to the Lord. The Lord God has spoken and blessing is going to come to his house forever. So we end the prayer which this ending demonstrates that David has confident assurance that God will do what he said he will do. It's in his hands. Now, as we end, I would like to go back and read this entire prayer and be a little test to see how much we can remember, huh? 
Verse 18, Then King David went in and sat before the Lord and said, Who am I, O Lord God, and what is my house that you have brought me this far? And yet this was a small thing in your eyes. O Lord God, you have spoken also of your servant's house for a great while to come. And this is instruction for mankind, O Lord God. Again, what more can David say to you? For you know your servant, O Lord God. Because of your word and according to your heart, you have brought about all this greatness to make your servant know it. Therefore, you are great, O Lord God, for there is none like you, and there is no God beside you, according to all that we have heard with our ears. And who is like your people Israel, the one nation on earth whom God went to redeem to be his people, making himself a name and doing for them great and awesome things, for your land before your people, whom you redeemed for yourself from Egypt, nations and their gods. Verse 24, And you established for yourself your people Israel to be your people forever, and you, O Lord, became their God. Now therefore, O Lord God, the word that you have spoken concerning your servant and his house, confirm it forever and do as you have spoken. And your name will be magnified forever, saying, The Lord of the armies is God over Israel, and the house of your servant David will be established before you. For you, O Lord of the armies, the God of Israel, have uncovered the ear, meaning revealed, saying, I will build for you a house. Therefore your servant has found his heart, his courage, to pray this prayer to you. And now, O Lord God, you are the God of your words, and you are the God, and your words are true, and you have promised this good thing to your servant. Now, therefore, may it please you to bless the house of your servant, so that it may continue forever before you. For you, O Lord God, have spoken, and your blessing shall, or rather, and with your blessing shall the house of your servant be blessed forever. Let's pray. Oh, Father, again, what a marvelous opportunity we've had today to study your word and look at the response of how a faithful believer responds to such great gifts. In David's case, the Davidic covenant. And Father, we thank you with all our hearts, with not only what we have had in the past, but in the present but also the things that we can't even name that's coming to us in the future. We thank you for these things. In Jesus' name, amen.